This is the second message in our series, Dear Church, uh, Letters to the Seven Churches of the Book of Revelation. And so that's going to take us on a span of nine weeks. Started last week. We're going to go through now the seven letters. We're going to start with Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, where we're going to be looking at the church in Ephesus. Next week, uh, you may even want to, and you'll see on your bulletin, I'll always try to give you a heads up of where we're going next week so that you can be reading the passage of Scripture and also what the title is in regards to uh, the next sermon. You might want to be prepared so you can read uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, and we'll be looking at that church next week. But this week, we'll be looking at the church of Ephesus. On the ninth week, we're going to be spending a time in prayer. That will be the whole service is going to be prayer. We're going to be praying for LifeBridge. We're going to be praying for Church Plant Explore Church in Eastern Passage. We're also going to be praying for a number of the churches that we have been putting on our screen each and every week in the HRM because we do not have the corner on the spiritual market. I hope you know that, that God is doing a work throughout uh, the HRM through his church and not just little old LifeBridge, which happens to be a local church, all right? And we're also going to be praying for the church in Canada, and we're going to be praying for the church uh, universally. And uh, so that's going to be a great morning where we're going to do that. But again, first, we're going to look at these seven churches. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to open up into Revelation chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 7. If you have an iPod or an iP iPad, that's great. You can use that. If you don't own a Bible, I want to make sure that you uh, grab one. We have them free of charge at the uh, Welcome Center over there, and you can grab one. Even if you wanted to get up now, that is totally fine. We're good with that. But uh, we're going to be looking uh, at Revelation 2, 1 to 7 this morning. Now, in the year 1677, I don't think any of us were there at that time, so you have to trust me on this. Historically, this was written down. A 27-year-old fella by the name of Henry uh, Skugel. I don't know if you know of anybody with that last name, Skugel, but it's a good Scottish name. And he was a Scottish theologian. He was a minister of the gospel. He was also an author. And he wrote the following to a friend, and he said this, The worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. I, I have to tell you, I think that is probably one of the most penetrating sentences in the English language. In fact, I would have to say it's probably one of the most penetrating sentences in any language. In fact, I would even venture to say it's a devastating sentence. And the reason I say that is because it lays us bare. John Piper said, the soul is measured by its flights, some low and others high. The heart is known by its delights, and pleasures never lie. Did you hear that? Did you catch that? I, I, I think there's a lot of truth there in that last line, pleasures never lie. I mean, you can fool, fool ourselves, you can fool other people in a lot of different ways, but pleasure really comes down to be the whistleblower of the heart. It is, because pleasure is the measure of our treasure. Try to say that four or five times in a, in a, in a row. Pleasure is the measure of our treasure. Now, I believe that Skugel, Henry Skugel, was brilliantly and biblically correct. He was right. The object of our love, the treasure we passionately want, the, the measures uh, that measures the worth of our souls, that's what it does. Now, if we, we agree with Skugel, I love saying that name, this sentence forces us that he gave us, forces us to do some soul searching, I think. So ask yourself the question. What do our pleasures really tell us about what we love? Two weeks ago, we talked about investing in the kingdom, investing in the mission of God, and we talked about that, how where your heart is, there your treasure is. Or where's your treasure is, there your heart is, rather. And it really tells us about what we love. And that, uh, two weeks ago, when we talked about that, we said, if somebody opened up your checkbook, what would that say about who you love or what you love? Probably say a lot of things. The other question you might want to ask ourselves is, what do our loves tell us about the condition of our souls? And I think those are necessary questions. I think they're important questions. But the truth is, our own introspection and our self-evaluation are, are typically not enough. And the reason being is because we're, we're, we're probably pretty poor physicians at, at, our own, at looking at our own souls. We often fail to see the root causes of, of our symptoms clearly, don't we? Uh, because we wear blinders to our deficiencies. I know I do. Debbie will point out an issue that 
yes, we're married, and, and of course, uh, she's allowed to do this, and she'll point out a deficiency in my life, and usually I put up my, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I'm better than that. But in reality, I pause and I think about it, and usually she's right. Usually is the operative word. But, but uh, we were blinders to our own deficiencies, don't we? And, and what we do is we swing from far, uh, thinking too far uh, highly about ourselves to all the way we swing to the other side where we're beating ourselves up with a self-criticism. And we can do this many times even in a day. What we really need to do, in fact, I would even encourage us is to invite Jesus Christ to search our hearts. You see, we need the diagnosis and the treatment of the great physician. David said this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And you find that in Psalm 139. So this morning, we're invited to now read a letter that Jesus wrote to a church, to the church of Ephesus, where he searches the heart of that church. The church of Ephesus by the way, could not see, based, left alone, based on their own searching, how far out of love with Jesus they had fallen. They thought they were, they were good. They thought they were in a great spot. But because they, they couldn't see how far out of love they were, they were in a dark place spiritually, even though they thought they were all that. That's because they had rested all their hope and their contentment and their satisfaction and meaning and purpose in being right in what they believed and not about being right with the one they believed in. See the difference? Being right in what you believe is not where it's at. It is being right in with the one you believe in. But Jesus wants them to live lives, you see, that, Brian sh that shines brightly with purpose and joy and fully realized satisfaction. And so counsels them to remember the love that they ha once had and to return to the passion they once had for him. And you know what? He wrote that to that church in Ephesus, but he's also meaning us to learn from that letter as well. That letter is written for us. Because it's only when we know Jesus intimately and when we truly love him that we're going to discover the meaning and the purpose we were created for, you see, church. And it's only then that, on, that the true hope for a future is going to be realized no matter what it is, whether it's personal or whether it's us as LifeBridge journeying together. And that is why that is part of our vision and our mission statement to know our, val our first value is to know Jesus intimately. You're going to get so sick of me saying this all the time, but I'm always going to be pointing back to Jesus. It's as we know Jesus intimately that we're going to grow, not as we get better at things. Fair enough, church? We're good? Okay, so let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and let's read that letter. It's seven verses and uh, we'll learn what Jesus has to say to this church and then ultimately to us. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So just so you get a picture, a mental picture of where this church is to begin with and who they are, this church was a center of tourism and trade in Asia, in Central Asia, Asia Minor, which is now we call Turkey. Uh, uh, so it gives you kind of a picture of where they're located. And at that time, now you won't find Ephesus there any longer. It's not a, it's not a city, a uh, thriving city, certainly. You will find some ruins, but that's about it. But at this time, when this letter was written, there were four major trade routes that went through this city. It was a major deal. It was somewhat uh, a cosmopolitan city in the ancient world, well known. They had a harbor that went right up to the city center. Today, you will find that Ephesus, because they had abandoned Ephesus, that all that bay, it would be like the Bedford Basin, had been filled up with silt, and so it's now a number of miles away from any kind of opportunity or possibility for a port. 
But at that time, it was a very wealthy city. Ships would come in and they would go. Uh, at the same time, it was quite a, known as a, as a pagan city. Uh, it was home to the largest temple in the ancient world at that time. The temple of Artemis, who was the daughter of Zeus and the twin sister of Apollo. Now, Acts 20, if you go through Acts 20, you'll see Ephesus uh, introduced there. And it gives us a background of the church where it tells us that Paul had lived with them and preached there for about three years. He uh, was well known by the community. You also have the book of Ephesians, which is a letter written by Paul to this uh, church to help us understand the profound degree to which they have been taught the truth, uh, predominantly through the Apostle Paul. And because of that, I mean, great training and teaching. I mean, if you're going to have a discipleship maker, it would have been the Apostle Paul, I'm thinking. And so these people were well grounded and, and, and they understood who they were in Christ and how to walk with Jesus and how to engage in spiritual warfare. The problem wasn't their failure to understand good doctrine and good teaching and, and their orthodoxy was sound, nor was the problem that they lacked perseverance. The church existed, in fact, during one of the most difficult times in the history of the early church. Beginning in 54 AD with the emperor Nero, Nero, there was this widespread persecution of Christians. And I'm sure many of these family members would have lost uh, people within the church, to, uh, lo losing their lives to this persecution. But even during this time, this Ephesian church had refused to bow the knee to Caesar, and they had stood firm in the midst of persecution, and they had learned how to stand against false teaching, against, against heresy. And that's why we see, I think, right away in verses 2 to 3, Jesus giving them some loving praise. Now, here's the neat thing about this, is that, or the interesting thing about this, is that not all the churches received praise from Jesus, but the church in Ephesus did. Why? He says in verses 2 to 3, this is Jesus now saying, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Boy, this sounds like a great church, doesn't it? It's a fantastic church. Now, the church of Ephesus was not a lazy bunch of people. They were getting at it. On the, they were busy working for the kingdom of God. Their calendar was full. The church website, by the way, if they had one at that time, would have been continually updated. The lights were always on in the church. I mean, potluck after potluck would have been a regular occurrence. And the youth pastor, he probably would have been one busy dude. People in their neighborhood would have looked out the door and watched these people and, and with all the activity and seen the lights all on. And they would have said, wow, these folks are some kind of good Christians. <laughs> they sure are busy. And that would have been the reputation they would have had in their community. But not only were they busy doing kingdom stuff, they took a, a strong stand against heresy. By the way, we need to be taking a strong stand against heresy as well. And I want to encourage you. I am a uh, finite human being. I am not an infinite human being. I am not God. And there may be times where I may say something from here that is not quite accurate. And if you're not sure about it, you need to be willing and, be, and you have the freedom to come challenge me about that and ask me about that. And that's what they would have probably done back then. They would have been going, okay, it sounds interesting, but really, is that what God wants for us? Is that what Jesus says? And so they took this strong stand against heresy because they wanted to be true. The Nicolaitans mentioned here, by the way, were the, the predominant false teachers that they stood against. These Nicolaitans seemed to be a sect uh, that had come out of the church. Uh, I won't go into all the history. It probably started by a guy by the name of Nicholas. And uh, they were trying to blend Christian teaching with uh, the idolatry and sexual worship that the Greeks and the Romans had already been engaged in. But the Ephesian church would have none of that. No, we're not doing that. We're going to stand strong. And they were all well grounded in the word. I mean, no doubt their pastor would have been a great preacher and a great teacher, right? And he would have probably given them some very, very great, clear application points to every sermon. By the way, uh, segue to the fact that at the bottom of your notes, there's some great uh, application points. I mean, their life groups, they would have gone, I'm sure they would have gone deep into the word. Not only had they withstood persecution, they had faltered, but they had battled false teaching and won. This was a good-looking church. And for these good things, Jesus gives praise. You see, Jesus wants us to stand on truth. After all, he is the truth, the way, and the life. Is he not? Yes? And he wants his church to be busy. After all, he's given us a mission, did he not? When Jesus left 
the disciples behind on the mount when he ascended in, back into heaven. Before he did that, he gave us a mission to make disciples, to go into the whole world making disciples and to baptizing them and to be teaching them. That sounds like there's orthodoxy mixed in with, with making disciples and being busy. I mean, that's great stuff. But there's a powerful insight, I think, to be learned here as we continue on in this letter. Just knowing the truth and being busy isn't enough, apparently. See, Jesus wants more than outward compliance. What Jesus wants is a heart that's changed, a heart that's transformed. I mean, it's true that we live in a culture in where our biblical teachings and our moral standards are under fire. It seems like today more than ever, and that continues on and continues to seem to increase. Just look at a newspaper, listen to a radio, look at uh, blogs on, on, on the Internet, whatever the case might be, and we discover that we're under fire. So we've got to be on alert. We've got to be on guard, church. We've got to be in the Word. We've got to be studying. But it's not enough to believe and do the right things. You see, Jesus also wants our devotion. Is it Jesus we love or the activity of the church? Is it Jesus we love or the great uh, orthodoxy that we stand on? Is it Jesus we love or the change that happens when we ch join a church community? Is it Jesus we love or is it the vibe I feel whenever I walk through the door? Is it Jesus we're devoted to or are we de more devoted to church growth? And I think those are fair questions for all of us to be asking. I mean, those other things in and of themselves are good. In fact, some of those could even be great. But if Jesus isn't the first priority, you see, if Jesus isn't valued above those other things, then we got it all wrong. We got it backwards. We don't have it prioritized correctly. And that was what was happen happening to the church in Ephesus at that time, you see. See, they were great at doing. And they were fantastic at knowing. But they were terrible at being. Here's what I mean. It's one thing to know about Jesus and know about his love, but it's an entirely different thing to be in love with Jesus. Get that? That's why after praising them in verses 2 to 3, he then moves into some wise counsel in verses 4 and 5. But I have this against you in verse 4, that you have lost your first love. You know, he's a good father, and, and he cares about the church so much so that he's going to share with them some wise counsel even after giving us a bunch of praise. My dad was a great example. I was blessed to have a father who was a great example of the picture of, of God as our father. Oh, my dad wasn't perfect. Yeah, don't, I mean, I, I pointed out a number of things he wasn't perfect in in his life. Um, but, um, yeah, I was that rotten kid. But at the same time, as I look back and I re remember my father, I remember how great he was at representing God the Father. I mean, I, I know it's hard to believe, but I, I got into trouble a few times as a kid. And my dad would always say, and he would say often, if you ask any of my siblings what my, what my, or his grandkids, what did, what did granddad or what did dad say often? My dad would always say, I love you. And there would be times when I would get into trouble and my dad would sit down beside me and he'd say, you know what, son? I love you. And I'm proud of you. However. <laughs> and he would then proceed into wise counsel. And as I grew older, until the day he passed away or very soon in that season, I would often call my father up for wise counsel, knowing I'm not perfect, knowing he's not perfect, but knowing that I could receive wise counsel. Why could I do that? Because I knew he loved me. And that is the same with Jesus. You see, Jesus loves this church. He loves LifeBridge. He loves the church in the HRM. He loves the church in Ephesus. And so he, he certainly is, is telling them how much he loves them and what they're doing good, but he also says, but However, there's an issue, and I love you enough to tell you. This church had started out strong, but over time, you see, things had begun to change. A generation had come and gone since Paul had preached to them, since Paul had discipled them, had spent time with them. And while they had remained faithful to the Word of God and they had endured hardship, rah, rah, the likes of which, by the way, most of us would probably never experience, and hopefully we may never experience or know about, they had lost their passion. Instead, their hearts had given way to this mechanical orthodoxy, the, the, a ritualistic form of service that last, lacked enthusiasm and last zeal, last heart. You see, church, that, I think, is a warning for us. We've got to be on guard of that. We need to be guarding against making Jesus less than the supreme value in our lives. 
You see, he's got to be our first love. It has to be. Because if we lose our first love, we're soon going to become infatuated with knowledge instead of relationship. What we know becomes more important than who we are. See? We become convinced that knowledge is what makes us holy. Knowledge, something we can attain for ourselves, replaces God's presence in our lives, which is something we can't do for ourselves. I'll say that again. Knowledge, something we can attain for ourselves, replaces God's presence in our life, something we can't do for ourselves, and we have to guard against that. And what happens is when we, when we lose our first love, we also begin to lose our evangelistic zeal, and we see the world as our enemy to be protected against instead of our mission field to embrace and love. We, we, we need to understand that we don't come together to get our weekly holy huddle fix. That's not our purpose. We come together weekly in order to be encouraged and to recapture the mission and the vision so that we can be effective during the week. You see, in other words, we gather so that we can scatter to represent Jesus in the world that we live in. When we lose our first love, we become content with what we are instead of being driven to become more like Christ. And we need to become more and more and more like Jesus. See, what happens when we do that, instead of comparing ourselves to Jesus, we begin to compare ourselves to one another. Well, at least I'm not like so-and-so. At least I'm better than he and she or whatever, the, however we present that. And so if I'm better than them, I'm okay. But you see, that attitude, what does it do? It only leads to self-righteousness. When we lose our first love, we allow other things to sit in the throne on our, on our lives and we relegate Jesus now to a lesser place of importance. Yes, he's still in our lives, but he's just not that important. And other things then begin to reign. It might be success, it might be power, or pride, or prestige. It might be marriage, money, parenting, or a job. It could be all those good things. It could be habits that we battle. We put them even above Jesus. Pleasure, or maybe it's entertainments. Something else sits on the throne of our lives when he becomes lesser. And as a re result, we become dispassionate and we become cool in our relationship with Jesus. So think about this. What kind of relationship did Stephen, I mean, think about Stephen, the first martyr for the faith. What kind of relationship do you think he had with Jesus? Do you think that it would have been just kind of a shallow, a formal, ritualistic relationship? I mean, the guy ended up uh, dying for his faith. He did not just go through the motions. He did not lack fervor and zeal. Not at all. That's not the kind of relationship you see that causes somebody to die for Jesus on purpose, willingly. What kind of relationship do you think Paul had with Jesus? I mean, this guy, when he was, he was beaten, he was left for dead, he was in prison, and he knew he was going to be executed, and yet he still pursued Jesus. And he still encouraged others to pursue Jesus, saying that this is the best life in fact, for me to live is Christ. But to die, I win. To die is gain, he says. It's a win-win situation. Compare that with the kind of relationship you or I have with Jesus today. And I'm not saying that we're all dead people. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think these are good questions for us to ponder if we want to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. What kind of relationship uh, uh, do you have with him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus like Stephen or Paul? Or do we find little or no time for him on a daily basis? He's unwilling to give up our comforts, let alone our lives, for him. Where, where are you at? Where am I at? And I think we need to be asking these hard questions about ourselves. Church, listen, listen. Jesus never asked for part of our lives. You know what? He asked for all of it. Jesus never has asked for a place in our heart. He's asked for all of it. He never asked to be one of the many passions. No, he asks to be the consuming passion of our lives. What Jesus wants is for us to love him like he loves us. And he demonstrated that love for us on the cross. He suffered and he died for us and he, he bore our sins on Calvary's cross, not because he was forced to, but because he was passionately in love with you. And he wanted us to be brought into this relationship with the Father. Jesus has never lost his passion. His love for us burns white hot. It's a, as passionate today as it was when he hung there on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them because they have no idea what they're doing. We, the church, are his bride. And he loves us like a husband loves the wife of his youth. 
It was uh, Valentine's, uh, what, on Friday, right? Friday, it was Valentine's Day. And I posted on Facebook a picture of Deb and myself, 31. Uh, it will be 31 years in June that we've been married with this great picture of us uh, at our, on our wedding day. And I remember that day uh, like as though it was yesterday when we first got married. And, and I often remind her how lucky she is. <laughs> Actually, no, it's the other way around. It is. I married up, is what I say. I married well. But imagine now, after that wedding day, after that picture was snapped, and everybody had gone home, Deb looks at me and she says, hey, thanks for the party, but I'm kind of busy, so I'll see you once a week for about an hour, unless I got something else up. You, could you imagine? How would that make me feel? In fact, how should that make me feel? Here's the point I want to make. I wonder if there are any ways where we do that to Jesus. Church, this morning I want to invite each one of us, or encourage rather, each one of us to invite Jesus to search our hearts. Let's do that this week. Even do that this morning. Now secondly, we see, or the, the third point I want to bring out is we see that Jesus gives them a personal challenge. He loves them again. So, she tells them he loves them. He, uh, he gives them some wise counsel, and then he challenges them. Kind of take the next step. And he says to them, in verses 5 to 7, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from his place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which, by the way, I also hate, he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Truth of the matter is that, yes, we are one body, but the church is still made up of individuals. Each one of us are separate and in our own lives, even as being part of the body. And this is why, although the message is addressed to the church as a whole, to the body, it comes down to the individual here in verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is where now we allow Jesus, the master soul searcher, to search our hearts and our motives. It's what he did with Peter. If, uh, for those who might remember the story, after uh, their post-resurrection seaside breakfast. You'll find that if you don't know the story. It's in John chapter 21. Great story to read and to learn about the heart of Jesus. What had happened was just days before this incident, Peter had tragically failed to love Jesus and he denied even knowing Jesus three times. And so that morning now, we fast forward to John 21. That morning, after lovingly serving him a meal on the beach, Jesus then turns to Peter and he asks him a question. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? And he asks that question three times. I, find, I always find that interesting. With Peter, it's always three. Maybe it's because Peter's so slow. You know, even the vision that he had where the... Uh, where the um, all the unclean uh, things came down in his vision. It had to happen three times for Peter. Peter denies Jesus three times. Peter asks him, do you love me three times? And Jesus accomplishes so much in this brief but life-altering conversation. It's an amazing conversation. And read it because you, there you get to watch Jesus beautifully restore and commission and prophesy over Peter. But you also see him expose Peter. Peter's denials were real, and they were horrible failures. And, but uh, Jesus is, is still exposing him and, and showing him that. And I think Peter needed to see that. In fact, I know Peter needed to see that. Now, Jesus is repeating his question three times. And I don't think it was just to allow Peter to affirm his love for every denial that he made. It wasn't just tit for tat. He was also probing deeper into Peter's soul, is what he was doing here, into the painful place of shame. And he's calling out a love stronger than before. One that would endure, as you see later, when Peter lays down his life for Jesus. The truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, I think, we, 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 like Peter, have also failed to love Jesus in the past. I know certainly have too many times. Perhaps we denied him publicly at some point, or uh, certainly we've denied him thousands of times in private, choosing to pursue other treasures because we believe they held greater pleasure and were more value than Jesus. These failures are real and horrible, and I, I think they're worse than we might realize. But the question out of all, is it, all of this is, are we allowing the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of sin that sucks us in to choke out our love for Jesus? 
Have we grown accustomed to talking hypothetically about, and uh, dutifully even about loving Jesus while passionately wanting and pursuing other things? If so, our pleasures are, are blowing the whistle that our hearts aren't enthralled with Jesus. That's what it's doing that we don't love him supremely. Now, if that's you, then I invite you to do what I did this week. Because this sermon also challenged me. It's not just for you. In fact, more than anything, it's probably for me. But this is what I did this week. I, I, I came to Jesus, and I repented, and I invited him to search my heart and to allow him to ask that probing question, do you love me? I journal. I write down a lot of my prayers, and I wrote that down. And i got to tell you, it was a little scary. Because I'm thinking, what if he... You know, what if, what if he really points out where, where I need to fix myself? But you see, Jesus loves us enough to gently show us where we need to grow and where we need to change. You, got, you, you don't need to be afraid of that question. Because at the end of the first letter from Jesus, you see a promise being offered. And that's, Jesus is about reconciliation. He's not about condemnation. And he says in verse 7, to the one who conquers, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What's he talking about there? The one who conquers are those who, knowing we're not perfect, knowing that we live lives that are broken, commit to following Jesus, making him the, the highest value in the universe, understanding that it's less about being right in what we believe, in, believe and all about being right with the one we believe in. And for those of us who do make Jesus our highest value in the universe above all other things, we are promised the tree of life. And that's great. If you go back to, the, to uh, the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, we're talking about now the Revelation, the last book in the Bible. But if we go to the very first book in the Bible, Genesis, we read the story about, about these trees in the, in the Garden of Eden. And God had placed right in the middle of all these trees a tree called the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. And he told Adam and Eve that they might freely eat of every single tree in the Garden of Eden, except for the tree of knowledge. I mean, one simple rule. They had one job. One job. And what happened? Eve was disobedient and ate of the tree anyway. She had been deceived by Satan in the form of a serpent. And then Adam comes along and he chooses, interestingly enough. He wasn't deceived, but he actually chooses to eat of the, free, of the tree as well. They chose their own will over God's perfect and uh, good and perfect will. Above their own, way above their own. And through this, that simple act, what happened? Sin entered into the world. And that is why, church, now we live in a world that's broken, that, that lacks peace. That is why pe people struggle to find meaning and purpose and contentment and true and lasting satisfaction. These words regarding the tree of life found first, by the way, in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and 2, 9, and now here in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is in there for a reason. It's that way for on purpose. You see, it binds the beginning and the end of the Bible together. It's kind of the opening chapter, and now the closing of the chapter of the book, of the story. It brings it all together, all of which, first to last, is concerned with the recovery of what was lost right at the beginning in the fall. And so Jesus is now at the end giving us a promise that even though we might have failed, even though we all have brokenness within and there's brokenness around and around us, that he is in the restoration business, you see, and he has a plan. And his plan is to bring all things back to the state of wholeness and completeness and purpose that he had created for us right at the beginning. His plan now, you see, church, is coming full circle and we are now invited to be a part of that plan of reconciliation and renewal. Isn't that great? Adam and Eve were sent from the garden, and now we're being given an invitation to return. That's so cool. That's fantastic. So here's a question for you. What is God saying to you personally this morning? Maybe you haven't experienced a personal relationship with Jesus, and, uh, uh, and you haven't ever experienced the joy of Jesus forgiving you of your sin and bringing you into a loving relationship with him. If that's you, then you can know that Jesus is already waiting for you to accept that gift of renewed relationship and that new start with him. You can enter into a brand new future today, if that's you. For those who have been walking with Jesus already, I believe he's asking us to do the same thing that he's been asking the church in Ephesus. He's asking us to remember where we once were. And think about that day when you first met Jesus when he redeemed you, when he saved you from all your sin, when he cleansed you and he made you new. 
He's asking us to remember where we once were. And if we need to come back to the passion you and I once had for him, if that is faded, that is what he wants for us. This morning, I invite anyone who wishes to, by the way, I'm going to ask to, uh, if you want to make a renewed loving commitment to Jesus, or even for that matter, a first time commitment, what I want to do is invite us all together, uh, first as individuals, and then secondly, as a church body, to publicly declare our intent to love Jesus with our whole heart, our mind, our souls, and our strength, and begin a fresh journey to know Jesus intimately. So I invite you to stand with me, if that is you, if you wish to do this together. And we're going to read a prayer out loud together. You'll see it on the screen. And let's personally offer our love, our first love to Jesus together. So first of all, together. Lord Jesus, I confess my horrible failure to love you. My pleasures have not lied, and they reveal how I have not pursued the triune God as my greatest treasure. I don't want another day to pass, allowing my love for you to languish in an apathetic place in my heart. So, I ask you, great physician, to come search my soul and know my heart. I present them to you. Address every grievous way in me. Ask your probing questions. I will hold nothing from you. Do whatever it takes to revive my soul for you. I do not want to give my soul rest until you are my first love. Now that was a personal prayer. And now together, as LifeBridge, together let us commit a covenant relationship with, with Jesus. So together, we want this more than anything. To love the triune God with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. We believe the greatest affection is love. And we believe you are the greatest object of our love. And we believe we'll never be happier and the excellence and worth of our souls will never be greater than when we love you supremely. For you are the wellspring of all that is truly life. So, we ask you to revive our love for you, O Lord, whatever it takes. And we ask it in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. So if anybody has made this prayer as a public confession of faith, uh, uh, maybe your... Uh, wanting to follow Jesus for the very first time, or maybe you're in a place where you're renewing that, that uh, relationship again. I want to invite you to come and speak with me afterwards, and I'd love to help you journey forward into what it means to love Jesus as your first love. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bring you glory for who you are, for what you have done. We are so in love with you, but Father, we don't love you enough. I know that because we're human beings and we live in a broken world. But God, I pray that you would continue to show us what love truly looks like. And as we learn what that love looks like, that we would reflect that back to you, to each other, and to the world. That this vertical relationship becomes shown in this horizontal connection with each other. And so God, be glorified today. We love you. Amen.